this is actually, is this on? Yeah. This is actually an excellent nexus to our conversation here because this is a story about a TCE site, an old TCE site in the Northeast region. And this is a site, not just any site, but it's a site where uh, it came up, up on our radar screen last fall, I guess. And we thought about, okay, this is a site, an old site. We're gonna have a lot of these old sites, as Paul mentioned. Um, how can we do things quicker, better, cheaper, faster? We have a, a lot of things to do, a limited workforce, limited resources. How do we do things? How do we get the most bang for the buck? So a lot of thought went into this, this site um, that we're gonna go over. And we think we've developed some protocols that will be very useful in moving forward uh, on a mass production review of these older, old TCE sites. All right, so the site that I'm gonna talk about here is in Newton. It's a former auto salvage, part, uh, auto salvage yard in the 1930s to the 1990s with a history of bad housekeeping. Lots of horror stories there. Um, this was not a closed site. It was a DPS site, which is technically still open. Um, and as part of our systematic evaluation of DPA site, DPS sites with TCE, uh, we came across this filing. We had it audited. Um, we found that the, um, this DPS was filed, even though the up gradient well had TCE at 3.9 micrograms per year, and the down gradient was at 2,700. So our auditor looked at a potential issue here in terms of the validity of this DPS, which has been invalidated, and also on the concern that would exist. This is um, essentially a residential neighborhood. This old auto salvage yard was in some guy's house, so this is predominantly residential. Shallow wells only. So the alarms went off. Uh, this is a potential issue here. So again, we thought, okay, we got a problem out here. And as it turned out, the, the site was sold, of course, to a developer who put up condos, <laughs> residential condos, and both of the PRPs are gone. So now we have the poor condo owners uh, left holding the, uh, the bag here. So we didn't have a viable PRP. We needed to move forward. So again, we thought a lot about how can we do this in the most um, efficient way possible, the most bang for the buck. So what we ended up doing was installing a bunch of wells. Uh, we, we did it in-house with our own resources. Between September 2014 and May 2015, we installed 39 direct push um, small diameter wells. Uh, most of the wells were 20 to 25 feet deep. We were focusing on the water table interface, vapor intrusion issues, depth to ground water was 11 to 20 plus feet, and we found TCE as high as 3,700. I guess this is a screamer, 3,700. <laughs> Uh, I can hear a screaming right now, <laughs> micrograms per liter. So we hope we put a whole bunch of these um, direct push wells in. And of course you can't see this, this is incredibly small, but this is basically the neighborhood here. And what you can see um, are these purple colored boxes. These are the wells that had detections of TCE. And the yellow ones are where we found TCE more than 1,000 micrograms per liter. Uh, these are all water table wells. And basically the groundwater is flowing in this direction here, and not surprisingly, the heart of the plume, what we're seeing more than 1,000 micrograms per liter uh, goes in this direction here. So again, we put in 39 direct push monitoring wells, and we pretty much identified the area of, of highest concern in terms of vapor intrusion potential. So that was kind of phase one. Then we, of course, actually this was done concurrently. We also did residential indoor air testing, uh, starting immediately once we found out the problem out there. Uh, we ended up sampling in total 57 residential dwellings, 157 grab samples, more on that, much more on that in a few minutes. We also did uh, 16 canister 24-hour TO15 time-weighted uh, average samples. Uh, based upon this evaluation, we detect TCE in indoor air in 19 homes up to 180 micrograms per cubic meter, well above the imminent hazard level we identified seven imminent hazard conditions at this location. And once again, the map here, you can't see necessarily that much, but you can see the yellow boxes here. These are the houses that came back clean. Recall that the heart of the plume is here. Uh, the yellow houses came back clean. Um, the green houses had detections, and the red houses are the imminent hazards. So the imminent hazards basically paralleled the heart of the plume, uh, fortuitously, though, a number of houses had radon mitigation systems. Those are the blue boxes here, including a bunch in the middle of the plume. And um, they came back pretty good. Uh, there was only a trace in, the, in a few of the houses because the systems weren't necessarily perfect, but uh, pretty good, pretty effective. We had one house that had a radon system 
that wasn't working because I think a squirrel got into this fan and it wasn't working, and that was an imminent hazard. And we suggested they repair the fan immediately, which they did. And once the fan went back online, we retested it and it was fine. So seven imminent hazards, fairly high concentrations inside some of these dwellings here. Well, again, we talked about how can we do things quicker, better, faster, cheaper, bang for the buck. And what we focused on here was the use of grab samples. Typically, we do time-weighted um, samples for indoor air. Um, but we wanted to get quick data to try to rule in uh, potential issues and so we can know to, to work quickly to resolve them as fast as we can. So we did grab samples, and um, we used one liter Kynar bags. A lot of people use the term Tedlar, which is kind of like scotch tape. Uh, Tedlar is a certain type of material, which was ban well, not banned, but it was discontinued. I think it's back in the market. Uh, this is a different product called uh, Kynar, which is uh, like polyvinyl indene fluoride. It's a fluorinated polymer. Um, and we've tried a number of bags, but more on that in a minute, and this is probably the best that we've used in terms of its durability and, and lack of, uh, of, of problems using it. We generally obtained uh, grab samples in the basement and first floor, and we analyzed these on a portable gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Uh, we use, in this case, a HAPSITE GCMS um, as a portable gas chromatograph. We analyze it either on site in a mobile lab in this neighborhood or at a laboratory we have in the, in the Northeast Regional Office. Uh, this, this method can report, um, the reporting length of TCE is 5.4 <coughs> micrograms per cubic meter right at the imminent hazard value uh, for sensitive receptors. We also, we also report as a J value down to one micrograms per cubic meter using the screening technique on the GCMS. Sorry, I got a cold. Yes. The grab sample, is the bag filled just by opening it, or is there a pump? That's no, you see this handy little pump here. Uh, we have a little pump that pumps into the bag, and we fill it um, probably about three-quarters of a liter full. That way you can take multiple samples. And for those of you who don't know what a HAPSITE GCMS is, this is one of our HAPSITES um, that we have. This is actually in our laboratory in our Northeast Regional Office. This is in the mobile laboratory, which we deploy to the site on several occasions. This was very handy because getting access to people's houses is always a problem. People are busy, they're working. So we actually deployed the mobile lab on two different Saturdays um, and got a whole bunch of data. We were analyzing 30 samples a day in the mobile lab out at this location. So it was very um, useful to get quick, inform quick information to discern the nature and extent of the problem out there. This is a close-up of those bags that we used, the Kynar bags. These are the two, we have actually two GCMSs that we used We also did 24-hour traditional time-weighted uh, average canister samples using TO15. This was done by a contract laboratory. We use the st standard six-liter passivated steel canisters. Once again, we put separate cans in the basement on the first floor. They were analyzed by EPA TO15 SIM, which of course has a much lower uh, reporting limit, in this case here, 0 0.1 micrograms per cubic meter. So both of these are tools in the toolbox, right? That old analogy, tools in the toolbox, all things are good, PID meters, the canary we still have, um, GCMSs, portable GCMSs, they're all good, right? They're all tools in the toolbox. And um, not all tools, of course, are created equal. Um, the, the grab samples using a portable method obviously is not as robust as a 24-hour um, passivated steel canister TO15. <coughs> selective ion monitoring, they're not the same tool. They, they can't give you the same thing. But if your objective is to unscrew a screw, you know, either one might, might be suitable. And one's a lot cheaper than the other and a lot quicker. So uh, they're all tools. What, what is the comparability here? Uh, obviously, again, a, a one liter grab sample screening technique is not as, as good, quote unquote, as the standard. Um, sample integrity, um, the, the bags, we'll get into this in a minute, the bags are not perfect. Certainly not as good as a passivated steel canister. And there are issues with the sample integrity that must be understood. Representativeness. A grab sample is literally a two-minute sample versus a 24-hour sample. So there's obviously less representativeness in a quick sample. Detection limits. Um, we were using the full scan when we did our work. We can do a SIM, but we didn't. So we had, obviously, detection limits that were higher than the conventional TO15. Um, logistics. Well, that grab sample was pretty darn easy. You know, it's a five-minute sample. Knock on the door on a Saturday, you're in there. Um, putting cans in for 24 hours can be a, a hassle. You're going to make plans you know, for two different days. It, it may not always be that easy. It was that easy when we, when we did it. So that's, that's an issue. 
data reports, the time to get reports, um, we got data reports as, as quick as a half an hour after sampling, uh, typically within the eight hours, never more than 24 hours later we had data from the analysis. Compared to TL15, you know, you could pay for a 48-hour uh, rush or otherwise wait six to ten days. It's obviously a lot longer to get information back. Obviously the cost um, is much different. Um, in terms of our cost, because we already have these GCMSs for emergency response, uh, they were much cheaper to use the grabs than to use a contract lab to do the TO15. Um, it was at least uh, four or five times more money to use the contract lab per sample. So again, these, these techniques have their pros and cons. That's the way it is. That's how tools are in the toolbox. So basically, it's, it's, you've got to understand the limitations of the methods. No method's really you know, bad or good. It's all knowing what you can take away from the data that you get. That's the important thing here. So we spent a lot of time you know, thinking about um, the limitations of this grab sample technique. We know the, the pros, but there's definitely cons. The first one, of course, is that bags are not a perfect sampling container. Uh, everyone knows that. They, there's really two problems. One, they off-gas manufacturing chemicals, creating false positives and or false um, positive biases. We know that's a problem. They also sorb contaminants, creating a negative bias. We know both those things. And we spent a lot of time, actually, several years ago, looking at these in details. You can't see these here, but we basically, we uh, experimented with different types of bags. The Tedlar is by far the worst bag in terms of off-gassing chemicals. Uh, huge phenol peaks, as well as a chemical called N-N-dimethylacetamide. Huge peaks, a lot of off-gassing, not a good bag to use. There are others on the market. Some of them have these hydrocarbon humps. Uh, again, these are tests using either nitrogen or purified air to see what we're getting for off-gassing from bags. Ultimately, we found the Kynar, which is a brand name, to be uh, the, really the cleanest bag in terms of off-gassing. So we ended up using that um, as our bag of choice. In terms of sorption, we did a lot of studies on sorption, where we filled these bags um, with actually a TO14 certified standard containing 36 compounds, and we filled these bags um, in purified air or nitrogen gas, and then we tried to measure the percent recovery for the various chemicals. You can't see this, but this goes from vinyl chloride to orthoxylene, the various chemicals. There's actually more that I put here. And you can see that it, this is the percent recovery. This is 100% recovery here. And you can see that there is different percent recoveries for different chemicals based upon their sorptive uh, properties. Uh, and, and we knew that, and we understood that. TCE is, is here. The average TCE percent recovery in these studies was about 60%. Wes? How long was it in the bag? Uh, these were in the bag for probably three or four hours. Okay. Another question? Same question. Three or four hours. And uh, what, what concentration was TCE in the standard sample? We'll get to that, but there, this was an average of um, different levels. We used 1, 2 PPB, 5 PPB, 10 PPB, 20 PPB, 50 PPB, and 100 PPB. <laughs> so we did a broad range. This is the average here of all those. And in fact, uh, I'll show you the next slide shows you for TCE um, the actual different um, values. So. TCE, we did at 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, and 100 ppbb. And here's a corresponding micrograms per cubic meter for TCE here. Um, and the, the low levels had a pretty good recovery, 75, almost 75%. There was kind of a drop down, um, and they got higher toward the end. So there was this range of recoveries. Uh, some of it looks pretty bad here. Um, uh, I think. This was done two years ago, and I, honestly, I think the bags we're using now are a lot better. I haven't retested them, though. But you can see that there'd be some negative bias um, that would result from using these bags because they are going to sort. So that's a limitation. Question? John, would you recommend if people were using these as screening that they do like a, a sample blank with a bag just to test this recovery as, you know, for that sampling model? Yeah, I think the question was, should you do a sample um, Test your own bags. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And, and actually, what what we're doing, um, we actually reuse the bags. If the if the sample was fairly low level, less than five ppb of VOCs, we flush it up with nitrogen gas a couple of times, and we reuse it. Before we reuse it, we always test it. You know, we'll be flush it out, fill it with nitrogen gas, test it, certified. You know that it's less than um, 0.2 ppb for each VOCs. So all of our bags are, are pre-tested. 
Uh, we reuse them for two reasons. One, because I'm cheap. Uh, although the bags are fairly cheap. The bags cost about $10 a piece, but I'm still cheap. And number two, um, reusing the bags actually makes them better um, because um, any sorption sites are basically taken up. And, and I think the bags get much better in terms of uh, being left less sorptive after two or three uh, runs. And we probably use bags, on, reuse them on average, you know, five, six, seven, eight times. Uh, of course, when we get a high value, we throw the bag away, but a lot of our results are fairly low. I think um, from a data quality perspective, if it's a screening technique to kind of locate areas of Im imminent hazard, a low bias is okay. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. Oh, uh, high bias. Yeah. High bias is fine. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, right. I'm sorry. Got it confused. Correct. Did you use a correction factor? Right. Did not use a correction factor, and and you'll see why in a few minutes. Um, Again, these, this is from two years ago. This was actually a different uh, brand of bag. It was a kind hour, but it was, I, I think the bags have actually gotten better. And my gut sense is that there's less sorption these days. And I don't have the data, but the worst case scenario is you might be getting a negative bias of, of up to 50%. That's, again, we're trying to tease out the potential biases in this technique. So um, we're not gonna get a positive bias. Um, we may get a negative bias to some extent but I've got a lot more data to show you. All right, bottom line, Kynar bags likely to have low bias, the reuse of bags likely leads to less sorption, less bias. That's kind of my gut sense. I feel pretty good about that, actually. Okay, how about stability? You know, how long can you keep these samples? You know, you get them in a bag and you know, you gotta analyze them pretty quick, which is true. And again, uh, we normally analyze within eight hours, um, but never more than 24. But you know, what if we did? You know, what's the stability? So we also did testing on stability. In this case here, we did it at the site. Uh, using the bags that we currently have. So here's a, a graph here showing stability in a bag over four days. So, uh, and this is a high concentration. This is what I'm gonna call home number four in Newton. Um, and that, at time zero, had 120 micrograms per cubic meter of uh, TC, this indoor air sample. This was actually a basement apartment. Someone was living there. Um, after two days, we got 100. So not, not that bad in my mind, 20% reduction. And after four days, we were down to 80. It was actually a pretty linear trend, trend. Not that bad, you know, in terms of the screening technique. That was the high levels. We also did um, studies on low, lower level bags. This is home number two, 35 micrograms per meter at time zero. After one day, it went to 30. So, you know, 35 to 30, not tragic if you wait 24 hours. Um, this home here was like 23, day zero, and like 22 on day two. You know, that's pretty much, that's pretty good. And a, a low level here was uh, um, around eight micrograms per meter. And that basically stayed the same at, at day two and went down a little bit to like six on day four. So it looks like, and not unexpectedly, I guess, there's, there's um, more stability at lower levels, probably because there's less sorption that's occurring at the lower concentrations. So anyways, we felt pretty good that certainly a one day holding time would give us pretty good results. What is the seal of the bag like? It's like a polypropylene seal. Just, like a pet term? Yeah, it's like a valve. So you open it up and you pump the air in and you close it off. And then when we analyze it on the GCMS, the HAP sites, they have a, a probe that, and I'll just show you that in a minute, that takes the sample in at about 110 cc's per minute. Do you know that the decrease is due to the absorption and not due to leaking of the valve? Um, I, I don't know that. He asked if it's from the leaking of the valve. I don't know if, if it would leak or not because we have a pretty good connection between the, the valve and, and the uh, sampling train, so. What say it's connected during this time? No, no, when it's being stored, the valve is shut off. And then when we sample, we open it up and it's connected to a, uh, an inflow to the GCMS, which then takes the air sample out of there. I don't know if there's leakage or not. I, I, I don't know if there is, probably not. All right, so this is, if you don't know, this is, the, the, this is a company called Impicon makes this product called the Hapsite Gas Chromatograph Mass Spectrometer. Uh, we actually have two at MassDEP. They were procured for emergency response reasons, and they are, we are on call 24-7, uh, and we do respond with these. Um, for example, do you recall the incident in the Fenway last month where there was chemicals in the basement? Uh, we were called out there in the middle of the night to analyze those, those chemicals using these instruments here. So that's their primary purpose is emergency response, but we have them, so obviously they're available to be used, and in fact, they should be used. They, they, they work better when you use them every week. 
If you don't use them, they don't work that well when you need them in the middle of the night. So we have two of them. Um, this one is called the half site, um, called an SP plus. This is called the ER. These are two different units from um, this manufacturer. These are portable, transportable GCMS units. We have two, the SP and ER models. They're conventional 70 EV electron impact ionization GCMS. Uh, we run on full scan mode, 45 to 250 AMU is what we typically do. Capillary column, 30 meters. Um, these, the way these units work is um, you introduce the sample in, an, in the air phase. They're made to monitor air. So we basically introduce the samples, in the case of a bag sample, into this probe, which has a fan which extracts a sample at about 110 cc's a minute. There's also uh, a concentrator built in um, that allows you to load the concentrator, then to deload and desorb to get lower detection limits, which we use. So the screen technique that we use, um, we, it, we have it um, calibrated for 36 target analytes, um, including TCE. There's two internal standards, uh, 135 TRIS and BFFB. And I'm, I'm sure Susan remembers what BFFB uh, stands for, Bromo something or other. Uh, but it's internal standards that are built in. Uh, we use a six-point calibration between 1 and 50 ppbv for the VOCs, which is corresponding to 5.4 to 269 micrograms per meter for TCE. Uh, our calibration curve, the percent RSD of the relative response factor is less than 30, which is compliant with the mass DEP CAM. Our reporting limit is at our lowest calibration standard per CAM, which is the 1 ppb or 5.4. Uh, we do report a J value down to 0.2 ppb or 1 microgram cubed meter. Um, we have very high confidence uh, in that based upon many years of doing analyses and comparing them to TO15. Uh, and we do a daily check standard at 5.9 ppb every day before we use the instruments to ensure that we have proper operation. All right, so now the big question is, well, how does this compare these two tools? What's the comparison of these half site samples to the more conventional 24-hour TWA TO15. Well, we, we took the opportunity, again, this, this was an experimental site that we worked on. We're trying to find this information out, so we took the opportunity to get some comparison data. So all this data, first of all, was obtained during winter-type conditions. This was between late October to mid-February. So we're looking at you know, the, the prime BI portion of the years here. So we tried to get, um, we, we, we used 16 canisters, and we tried to co-locate them in the same places that we sampled using a crab sample, and we tried to get comparison data um, from either synoptic or near synoptic grab TWA samples. And this little crude diagram here, this is, this is the day that we actually sampled the 24-hour samples of the TWA. So um, the X's represents the grab samples. So for most of our comparisons, we have one grab sample that was obtained sometime during that 24-hour period with the tip where the canisters were being sampled. In a few cases, we had samples before and after, before and after. Uh, however, in some cases, we had data uh, either two days before or four days before or even five and six. So some of them were not completely synoptic, but you know, they were close, close enough for government work, I guess. So we, we used that to make some comparisons here. So if you compared um, all 16 um, pairs where we had time-weighted average data versus grab sample, um, here's the comparison here, um, and this is up to uh, 180 micrograms per meter was our highest values. So, I mean, the R squared was 0.915. Uh, it's not perfect. Um, in our minds, pretty good, though, for a screening technique A and B, uh, because, again, they're not synoptic. One's a 24-hour sample, one's a grab sample. So there's variability there to begin with. We knew that. So overall, the comparability in our minds was, was not bad, the overall comparability of all the data. Um, the basements were better because the basements, I think, obviously had less air exchange. These are typical basements. Most of them used for laundry. That's about it. Not accessed very frequently. You know, not a lot of windows, not a lot of ventilation. So there was less air exchange likely in those locations. And there were eight basement samples. And they compared better, 0.952 was the R squared comparing the grab to the 24 hour. Um, John, why, when you showed a low bias in the grab sample, but you're not seeing a consistent low bias in these data compared to the 24-hour. Do you have an explanation for that? We're seeing a high bias. Um, I don't have an explanation. I don't. That's why I said, first of all, I think there's less absorption than I, than I think we had in the, in the 2013 study. 
And there's also the variability, um, temporal variability in the concentrations, and there's also analytical variability. Um, even among, G, you know, TO15, there's analytical variability. So all those factors seem to come into play here. Yeah, you have a linear relationship, but it does consistently, your, your NAP site numbers are consistently higher. Yeah. Well, okay. not, you know, tremendously higher, um, but yeah, in, in some cases, um, 40% of the yeah, if we got 100, and this was about 70 here. Yeah. So this, this real-life data shows me that maybe you don't really have a consistent low bias when you're doing the bags out in real time. Yeah, that's right. I mentioned earlier that the data seems to show uh, a different trend to a degree. Question? Does the data in that table include both the sites where IH conditions were present and sites where IH wasn't present? Yes, this is all the data. We had, we had one site where, the HAP, where our HAP site said none detected and where the TO15 said none detected. That's the zero point here. So yeah, these are all the data points we have. So John, uh, again, back to the prior discussion, uh, the concern would be the imminent hazard threshold level, which is fairly low, right? We're talking about six, eight. Six to 20. Right. So how do you feel, it, so, although uh, the large scale is interesting, is the area of interest not the six to 20? How do you feel about the six to 20 or zero to 20, whatever range in terms of the bag versus? Yeah, well, this is actually for the basement. This is the zero to less than 100. And, and actually, there was a very good correlation, 0.999. Um, so yeah, I, I think we have more confidence in the lower levels, which are of more concern. Uh, I think on the higher levels, you know, there, there may be issues with the temporal variability in particular that can skew a two-hour, a 24-hour versus a two-minute sample. Question. So given that other data, the, the other chart that you have that showed like the sort of uh, percentages, the recovered percentages, is it reasonable to assume that if you do the screening, for TCE, and you get a level in the screening that's like, say, 50% um, or greater uh, of the IH, that you should go right back and take a SIM scan? Yeah, that's the whole point. I mean, it's, it's, Would 50% be like a reasonable screen? In other words, if you're less than 50%, are you probably okay with anything? Because it well, seemed to me like 50% was like the, the nastiest absorption you had on those bags, right? right. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get, there's another slide on that. The issue is, you know, what do we make of this data? What do we do with it? And, and there's lots of factors at play. There's analytical variability, um, there's stability uh, issues, there's temporal variability, which may be the most important element um, in the evaluation. So we don't have necessarily at this point, a, you know, a number, 50% is gonna be this, but certainly if we get a, a high detection on a grab sample with this technique, we have a concern that we have a problem that needs to be addressed quickly, either through follow-up analysis with the TO15, 24-hour sample, um, or other, other procedures. All right, um, again, temporal variability. We're, we're looking, Larry. Right, now, maybe you'll talk about it, but are you gonna talk about the upstairs versus basement uh, comparison at some point? Uh, the upstairs versus basement, I, I was gonna talk about it, but I didn't, uh, I'll tell you what it was. Not surprisingly, the upstairs was always higher than the basement. The average what, difference, what? I'm sorry, the upstairs was, upstairs was lower. I just see if you were awake, that's all. That was just, that was just a test. Yes, the... Um, yes, yes, I'm sorry. The, uh, let me say that again. The, uh, the upstairs was lower than the basement, and the average difference was a factor of 17 um, for the sites that we did the analysis. So on average, the basement was 17 times higher than the first floor. And, and again, these aren't cast in stone. There's all kinds of vari variables at work here. Everyone knows that with vapor intrusion. Um, but that's what we found here. Um, there were a few sites where the levels were fairly low in the basement, and, and the first floor basement were, were pretty close. But for most situations... 17% higher? Or 17 times higher. higher. 17 uh, times higher. In so, in the basement. So if I have 170 in the basement, you know, we're finding on average 10 on the first floor. And again, that, that should not be... Well, it's not a surprise, but it's also not, I would caution you about being over-quantitative here. It's, it's tremendously varied depending upon the actual situation. But might indicate an order of magnitude. Yes, and that's not surprising that you have stuff higher in the basement than in the first one. That's a, that's a line of evidence that, in fact, you have a vapor intrusion pathway as opposed to a source inside the building. Temporal variability. 
Uh, again, it's important to understand the analytical issues, stability, sorption, sorption biases, uh, but there's also the physical phenomenon that we're looking at, which is um, a, a tough critter to get a, hold, a handle on here. We know there's temporal variability in, in uh, vapor intrusion. We know that it's, it's episodic. Um, recent work by Paul Johnson in particular has shown that it tends to uh, occur mostly during the colder weather. Uh, he's concluded that during the, the colder weather, you have prolonged periods of emissions uh, interspersed with a few days of nothing during the cold weather. And in the summertime conditions, it's just the opposite. You have many days of nothing and then interspersed with a few days of emissions. So it's very episodic. Uh, we know that. Um, there's, there's the um, air exchange rates, there's the dilutions, lots of moving parts here. We know there's temporal variability in indoor air. We know that over the course of a day, over the course of a week, over the course of a month, over the course of a year, there will be variability. How much? You know, researchers say, you know, one, two, three orders of magnitude um, could be that variability, up to three orders of magnitude. If you analyze that 8 a.m. on Monday on January 1st versus, you know, 2 a.m. on April 15th, you know, it might be three orders of magnitude difference. So we know that. Um, so that's a concern. If you're getting a two-minute sample, you know, what do you, what do you make of that? You know, does that have any value at all? Well, certainly the data shows that it's, at least empirically, it seems to be pretty reliable. Um, but we try to look more at the temporal variability issue. And we actually had a house. Uh, this was home number five, where we had a very cooperative woman that was a tenant there. And she agreed to sample her basement every day at around 6 o'clock in a little bag. And fortunately, she worked about two miles from the, from the Wilmington office. So every morning, I would drive there and pick up the bag. And um, we would analyze it. And we did that for 16 straight consecutive days between February 24th and March 10th. And w one of the problems was some days she forgot to do it. And I couldn't yell at her because she's so nice. Um, so this green bar here is actually the holding time. You know, most of these were done within one day of being collected. Uh, oops, she forgot that day or she was out of town or whatever. It was a weekend. So... There were a few days where um, the holding time was higher than one day. Sometimes it was up to four days, five days here. Now, we did have a stability study to understand you know, the potential negative effects. Um, at these concentrations, we're looking at you know, between 8 and 18 micrograms per cubic meter. That sweet spot between the 6 and the 20. That's why we selected this house. Um, so we knew there'd be some um, negative bias for the three, four, five-day holding times. And, and we kind of saw that here. So anyway, as you can see that on the first day, it went from 18 you know, to 12 to 14 to 11, back to you know, 15. You can see the, the variation here. And you can see where the holding times were the, were the highest. There was clearly indication of a negative bias. So this is probably higher up here and here. But what's the bottom line here? You know, it's, oh, by the way, because someone's going to ask, did you look at the barometric pressure, John? Yes, I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the barometric pressure uh, trends over that time period from Logan Airport. Um, you know, not that enlightening. Well, how about the wind? Yeah, same thing. You know, there was, there was wind data, wind, wind, windy and unwindy, and I'm not clear this, sure there's a good cause and effect um, data there. And finally, the temperature. And the temperature went from zero on the first day. This was our winter that we had last, last year. Went from zero on the first day uh, to 45 degrees. So there was a pretty good range of temperatures uh, so these are the factors that drive vapor intrusion. And I don't know if you can tease out a trend or not, but the bottom line here is that it's, it's plus or minus 50%. You know, we're talking about orders of magnitude differences in temporal variability um, from data, from studies. Personally, we don't see that. I don't know about you guys. I don't see that degree. I'm not questioning the data, but um, I'm not sure it varies, particularly over the course of only 24 hours. But here... We're seeing a variability. This is the basement, so there's less air exchange. But the variability here um, was plus or minus 50% over a 16-day period. So in terms of, well, what's, what good is a two-minute grab sample? Um, That's actually really tight. I mean, if you, if you took away some of those um, <coughs> holding times really exceeded, and you just look at the ones that are more like one or two day, you're, you're getting within a few micrograms per meter cubed plus or minus, that's pretty tight for analytical work. I mean, I would not I agree. consider those points different from one another on a relative standard deviation analysis. 
Yeah, the comment was, you know, if you look at analytical variability and look at the negative effects of the holding times, this is pretty much the same. Yeah, I agree. But again, I'm trying to tease out the, the bookends of extremes here of what we're looking at. Because the obvious question is, what good is a two-minute sample? That's, that's ridiculous. It's laughable. Because, you know, it's going to change by a factor of 100, you know, five minutes later. I don't think that's the case, you know. Um, it certainly wasn't the case here. Well, this is just one house. Um, it, it, there are obviously situations where it can happen. You know, there can be a, a market change in any given location for various reasons. But I, my suspicion is that the variability over 24 hours is much less than the variability over seven days or a month or a year. So I think the two, you know, the two minute grab sample um, is not unnecessarily um, trivialized by the fact that it's only two minutes. Have you thought about the fact that the samples were collected at the same time of day? And that, so some of that variability that we would expect to see over a 24 hour would be because of, because of different conditions in the building during that period, and, and that's not observed here. That's a good point. These were more or less the same time of day, not always exactly the same. Uh, untrained volunteers, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there, I suppose there could be you know, changes within the building over a 24 hour. That, that would be another study we can do, right. actually. Like morning, if it's been cold overnight, and then the heat comes on, is that a con? You That's know, a good not point. Not that you need to get into those weeds, but it, there, there could be more variability than there's seen. No, that's a good point. I'm, I'm actually seeing a good relationship with parametric pressure if you, if you yeah. factor out those two long holding time ones, yeah. which are which artificial degrees of the trees on holding time. It looks like there's a, a decent relationship there. But if, if the pressure goes up, yeah. then you're driving stuff into the ground, right? right? Well, it's a well, be an inverse relationship, yeah. but, but that, yeah. it, does, it does look pretty, it does match pretty well, this current matching. Yeah, but, but again, the variability, the analytical variability is plus or minus whatever, 30%. Right. There's all, so it's hard to take any concrete messages. All I'm trying to get for a message here is that we're not seeing this, you know, order of magnitude variability uh, at these locations. We're not seeing it here anyway. So in our mind, that combined with the 24-hour versus grab sample data trends gives us some comfort that the two-hour grab sample, um, you know, while not perfect, is, is not a bad tool to use. So again, John, going back to the, you know, we're screening the indoor air to try to determine whether or not we have a problem, whether or not we have an imminent hazard. What is this telling you that a Kynar two-minute grab sample, where would that number be to give you, you, the level of confidence as the department to say to the homeowner, you don't have a problem? Well, again, the question is, what number will we get? You know, I think, I'm not sure we have a number, an actual number, but certainly if we're getting um, levels in a grab sample above the imminent hazard value, that would, in our mind, put that on our radar screen. Well, of course. I'm right. just saying, but, but to go the other way, to rule it out, right. you know, well, I mean, the summa had for 24 hours and it was six, you would feel comfortable in the residence, but with the two-minute Kynar bag sample, would it be two? Three. I'm just saying, no. based on what you're thinking, I, mean, it seems I think like we need a work group for that. <laughs> I, I'm just saying oh. the reporting limit's a little above five. So even though they're reporting J data on that screening right. level, the reporting limit's five. Right. That's so if you get anything above the reporting limit, from my point of view, I think you need to be a little concerned. Now, the other benefit, too, when we get the basement first floor, if the basement's not being used, which is most of the case here, that's also helpful because you know if the basement you're getting 30 and the first floor you're getting one or two J values, you're not at the at the moment you're not seeing right. an issue, but it's certainly the potential is there. Right. Right. Versus if you got you know two or three in the basement and nothing on the first floor, you feel better. Nancy? I'm sorry if this is repetitive. I couldn't hear the first comment, but I don't think that this is a method that you would want to use because of the Yes, you'll see my, my summary slide will say exactly that. <laughs> we think exactly the same. So let me just get to my, um, here it is right here. The conclusions on grab versus time with average. Kind of bad grab samples are likely by a somewhat low, although the data doesn't show that. Um, but I think importantly, the, the, the probability of a false positive uh, is unlikely um, in terms of, these, in terms of um, interference in the bag itself. Um, but you know, there may be a, a low bias, but the data is showing that there's not. The Kynar bags are a good school tool to screen in potential sites of concern and where appropriate trigger the need 
for accelerated follow-up actions. They are not a definitive tool to screen out a problem. Well said, Nancy? Yes, just what you said. Um, so anyways, that's, that's the utility that we're looking at these, uh, basically to identify a site um, where, um, and, and where we've done this at other sites, sometimes we conclude, up oh, the levels are low, you know, there's no need to rush out there tomorrow with 48 hour turnaround times, we have the luxury of time, versus you know, we're getting high levels, we've got to move quickly to get 24 hour data or what have you. And by the way, the 24 hour data, I, I've got to say, um, I mean, that needs to be further evaluated as well. The, uh, how representative is a 24 hour data? I, I mean, people that are getting one 24 hour in over one winter, if you look at these studies and statistics, that's not telling you a lot about screening out a problem. Um, yeah, so 24 hours is a better two minute sample, but one 24 hour over a winter, uh, I don't know how anyone can say that that rules out a problem either, but that's a separate issue. Sure. Yep. If, if you can't, if you can't screen out anything using this, this method, um, what, what, if you, if that means you have to go and you're going to have to do cans and all these houses anyway. What do you, what do you gain other than a couple of days on a, on a problem that's probably going? Better than two minutes. On for a four hour. Well, the difference, particularly at DEP, is looking at 100 sites where there might be an issue and just trying to do a triage, which ones go to the top of the list, which ones don't. This is an excellent tool to do that. Also, um, well, potentially. But the other issue, too, is for things like TCE, a week of exposure is of concern. Um, people don't generally pay for a 48-hour turnaround. And just getting permission to sample someone's house can take a week. So we've seen utility in getting information almost instantaneously the next day once we find out about an issue. So we do see the value of getting data you know, quicker rather than waiting for the 24 hour. Well, this gets back to Susan's comment earlier today, I guess. Uh, the difference of a week in the situation where people have presumably been exposed to this for some period of time before this. Um, and that sort of highlights the need to actually finish the screening and, and get this done sooner. The, uh, the Back. Well said. Let's move on. Um, the next thing we want to look at is mitigation.